At 3.40pm on May the 9th, 1980, a group of five armed men stormed the local branch of the Security Pacific Bank in the small town of Norco, California, with the intent to rob it and make a quick getaway before any police showed up. And that didn't happen. What should have been a quick, clean getaway instead turned into one of the fiercest gun battles in modern American history, an incident which has become known as the Norco Shootout. Now, it's probably worth just taking a quick look at the time period in which this event takes place. If you think of the 1960s as a groovy all-night party, then the 1970s could best be described as the bad hangover the next morning. For example, recreational pot smoking of the 60s had become rampant hard drug abuse by the 1970s. The hippie idea of promiscuity and free love had ushered in a tidal wave of unwanted pregnancies and soaring cases of VD. Commune lifestyle had been supplanted by sinister-like cults and fake gurus, and peaceful protest movements had given way to violent militia groups, like the Weather Underground, the SLA and the Black Liberation Army, all of which had openly declared war on the police. Urban crime was soaring, inflation was out of control, and combine all this with rising Cold War tensions and the build-up and stockpiling of bigger and deadlier nuclear weapons, and it's no wonder that some people had come to believe that they were actually living in the end times, and that Armageddon was just around the corner. The two people who believed that America was about to go up in flames were 29-year-old George Smith and 27-year-old Chris Harvin. At first glance, Smith seemed like an all-round regular guy. In school, he'd been the editor of the school newspaper, he was in the chess club and he sang in the choir. However, a stint in the military as an artillery man working around tactical battlefield nuclear weapons had convinced him that a nuclear conflict with the USSR was inevitable. And this belief, combined with a streak of religious fervour, had given Smith the notion that the biblical apocalypse was imminent. Harvin, on the other hand, wasn't religious but he too believed that the end was nigh. Now, for him, it might be an asteroid impact, a weird alignment of planets, or the revenge of Mother Nature on an ungrateful human race, but the main thing is that he also believed that the end was coming. The pair of them decided they needed an off-grid survival cabin in which a few like-minded and heavily armed individuals could ride out the coming storm. The trouble was, survival cabins in the mountain of Utah weren't going cheap, and Smith and Harvin were pretty much broke. So, the first get-rich-quick scheme that Smith and Harvin embarked upon was growing marijuana to sell. They had about 300 plants growing in a shed at the backyard of the house that they shared. This was protected by a high razor wire fence, and it was complete with an emergency escape tunnel in case they ever got busted. But, when the dope-selling business failed to get off the ground in any meaningful way, they had to come up with another plan. To Smith, the answer was obvious. They just ought to rob a bank. You see, by 1980, Los Angeles had become known as the bank robbery capital of the world. The vast, sprawling city was perfect for anyone looking to rob a bank and get away with it. The close proximity of many local bank branches to the freeway on-off ramps meant that bank robbers, if they were quick, could be out and on the freeway before the first police even arrived. By 1980, there were on average six bank heists per day in the LA urban area, and many of these crimes went unsolved. People were getting away with it every day, and to Smith, it must have looked like easy money. Now, neither Smith nor Harvin had any experience of armed robbery, but they set about planning their first bank job like a pair of hardened cons. First off, they realised that they needed more men for the job. Chris Harvin's younger brother Russell was brought in, and two more brothers, 21-year-old Manny and 17-year-old Billy Delgado, were also recruited to the team. That made five guys in total, and Smith figured that would be enough men for the job. He selected the Norco branch of the Security Pacific Bank on 4th and Hamner as their target, and he began casing the branch, getting a feel for the layout of the building and planning the escape route. Smith had planned on them being in and out in under two minutes, this should be quick enough to avoid getting into a tangle with the local police, but just to be on the safe side, there were a couple of fallback precautions which he wanted to take. Firstly, a homemade bomb. The gang would set this off one mile away to act as a diversion and draw any police away. And secondly, guns. They were going to take lots and lots of guns. 
On the morning of May the 9th, 1980, Russell Harvin and the two Delgado brothers stole a 1979 Dodge van from Briar Mall, kidnapping the owner, Gary Hackler, so he couldn't report the van as being stolen. This was the van which they planned to use as the getaway vehicle, and so they were set to go. Five men who, prior to that day, had no history of violence and had had no major running with the police, headed out to rob a bank. Firstly, the gang planted the bomb which Smith had made to act as a diversion, and this was put on a gas line a mile from the bank and then lit. The gang headed down to the Security Pacific Bank and arrived there just after 3.30 in the afternoon. However, the bomb on the gas line failed to go off, so there would be no diversion. If they robbed the bank now, they were going to have to do it knowing that the full potential force of the local PD could be put up against them. Sitting in the van, the gang, now dressed in ski masks and parkas and sitting on a pile of guns, ammo and homemade grenades, came to a very fateful decision. To hell with it. They were going to go in anyway. A quick in and out and away before the police arrived. And so at 3.40pm, four heavily armed men burst through the doors of the bank. Smith, waving his HK-91 rifle in the air, yelled out, If any effing alarms go off, the effing bullets are going to fly. Now there was no going back now. However, a teller working at Redland Savings just across the street had seen the men going into the bank, and she immediately put a call through to the police. Even though George Smith was keeping his crew on the strict two-minute schedule, it was already too late. As the gang burst out from the bank with $20,000 in stolen loot, they ran straight into Riverside Sheriff's Deputy Glyn Balaski, who was waiting for them just outside. Without any hesitation, the armed robbers opened fire on Belaski's cruiser, bullets tearing through the windscreen and dashboard. Belaski was wounded but still able to drive, and he threw the car into reverse, slewing across traffic and crashing into a passing vehicle. The gang piled into the getaway van, and driver Billy Delgado accelerated hard, tearing out of the parking lot. But by now, Belaski was out of his vehicle, toting a pump action shotgun. He fired four times at the speeding van, and shotgun pellets tore through the thin panelling, catching Smith in the thigh and the driver in the neck. Billy Delgado, paralysed instantly by the pellet which struck him in the neck, lost control of the van and crashed into a telegraph pole right at the crossing of Forth and Hamner. It seems that surrendering at this point was seemingly not an option for the gang. Instead, they burst out of the crashed van and unleashed a massive volley of firepower at Belaski, who was crouched behind his cruiser. In just a few seconds, more than 200 rounds had been fired, and Belaski's car was riddled with bullets, being hit 47 times. Belaski suffered injuries to both arms, his face and his neck, but amazingly, he was still alive. By now, other police officers had arrived at the intersection, and in no time at all, a fierce gun battle was raging. The police were armed for most part with 38 revolvers and the odd shotgun, and they were hopelessly outgunned by the gang, who were toting Heckler & Koch G3s, HK91s, HK93s, Colt AR15s, as well as a variety of handguns, shotguns and homemade grenades. There wasn't a lot the police could do apart from take cover behind their cars and try not to get shot. All of this was taking place mid-afternoon at a busy road junction, and there were lots of people around. They were running for cover, crouching in terror behind parked cars, store windows were shattered from flying bullets, and the noise of constant gunfire was deafening. It must have been like being suddenly caught up in the middle of a battle without any warning. One police officer later remarked how it was impossible to just walk across the intersection without treading on spent shell casings. They were littering the whole area. The firefight raged for four long minutes before the robbers carjacked a passing yellow Ford F-250 pickup truck, piled in all their weapons, and took off towards the interstate, leaving behind them a scene reminiscent of a war zone. There were 12 injured police and civilians, and their own driver, 17-year-old Billy Delgado, was left convulsing and bleeding out in the Dodge. In the heat of the moment, they also left behind the $20,000 that they'd just stolen. Heading north on I-15, the shootout continued, as the robbers fired upon any and all police vehicles which were in pursuit, hitting cars which were as far back as a half a mile away. 
This must have been something like out of a Michael Bay movie. Imagine a pickup truck with the gang crouching in the back, tearing through the crowded interstate at high speed, firing semi-automatic weapons at the 40-odd police vehicles that were in pursuit, and throwing out homemade grenades and Molotov cocktails whenever the police got too close. It was completely insane. At one point, a San Bernardino sheriff's helicopter became involved in the chase, flying down low over the interstate to get a fix on the weaving yellow pickup truck. This was a very bad move. The robbers simply shot the chopper, and, billowing blue smoke, it was forced to land before it crashed. The chase went on, but having failed to outrun the small army of police that were in pursuit, the gang got off the interstate and headed for the Lytle Creek Canyon, taking a rough dirt track up into the San Bernardino National Forest and heading towards Mount Baldy. As the narrow dirt track switched back higher and higher, the gang pulled ahead of the police, but they could only get so far, as the track terminated in a dead end. So they pulled the stolen pickup to a halt, and they jumped out, weapons at the ready. Heading up the chase and first up the mountain track behind the gang was Riverside Deputy Jim Evans. He was a former Green Beret and Vietnam vet. He was an experienced police officer and he was no stranger to sort of hot situations like this. But he had no idea that he was driving straight into an ambush. As Evans rounded the last corner, the gang opened up on him. Diving from the car as it was riddled with bullets, Evans rolled on the ground and returned fire, striking Chris Harvin in the lower back. Evans managed to take cover behind the rear wheels to reload. Deputy Dan McCarty, who was in the car behind Evans, saw what happened next. All I could think was, don't get up, don't get up, but he got up, and he took a round in the right eye, which basically killed him instantly. Evans was dead but the gang carried on shooting from the end of the road. One round clipped McCarty's elbow, tearing out a lump the size of a golf ball. Luckily for McCarty, he'd heard over the radio about the gang's military-grade weapons. Thinking ahead, McCarty had grabbed a confiscated M16 assault rifle from the evidence locker at the police station before he headed out. With this weapon, at least he had a chance of evening the odds. Braving constant gunfire that riddled his car, McCarty managed to get the M16 free and loaded. He jumped up, squeezed off a clip, spraying the road and the truck with wild shots. When he stuck his head out again, the remaining members of the gang had gone. George Smith, Chris Harvin, Russell Harvin and Manny Delgado had fled into the canyon. May the 9th was a cold, miserable night in the mountains, and by dawn both George Smith and Chris Harvin, who were both wounded and bleeding out, had had enough. In stark contrast to the day before, Smith and the Harvin brothers surrendered meekly, even calling out to the searching police for help. The remaining member of the gang, 21-year-old Manny Delgado, refused to give up. He was eventually cornered by the SWAT teams which were combing the canyon sides, but having refused to surrender his pistol, he was shot dead on the mountainside. The Norco shootout was finally over. One police officer and two suspects were dead, and another 11 police officers had been injured. 33 police vehicles had been destroyed or damaged, a helicopter had been shot down, which caused local flights to be diverted and airports closed. It was the largest crime scene in American history, covering more than 40 miles, Thousands of rounds of ammunition had been fired, Molotov cocktails and homemade grenades had been thrown at police. And all of this was committed by a group of men who prior to that day had no history of violence. The Norco shootout was a slap in the face that awoke California to the fact that heavily armed, coordinated groups of deadly opponents were a fact of life. The Riverside and San Bernardino police departments reacted swiftly. Out went the old 38 six-shooters, replaced by 15-round semi-automatic pistols. One helicopter was fitted to carry an M60 machine gun, and the number of automatic rifles the police departments owned went from just two to over 50. Without doubt, the Norco shootout changed policing in America permanently. Even though this all happened way back in 1980, this event is still used in tactical and anti-terrorism training for police today. 
As for George Smith and the two Harvin brothers, they were all convicted of first-degree murder, assault, kidnap, use of explosives, and armed robbery. All three of them got life without parole, and they are still incarcerated to this day. Sitting in jail, I wonder if they ever ponder the fact that so far, some 40-odd years later on, the final apocalypse that they did all this for has yet to even materialise. For anyone interested in learning more about this bizarre event, there is a book, Norco 80, which tells the story in far more detail than I've covered here. Thanks for listening.